So hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 32 of Level Up, 60 minutes of live Q&A where your questions and votes really do drive the show. The Slido link in the chat allows you to vote up the questions that you would like answered and, of course, you know, to add your own. So today we're talking everything to do with project management and change management. And in particular, we're going to focus on portfolio management and what the blend is of art and science needed to really deliver value to organisations using those techniques. So let's jump straight in and meet our panel for today. Joining us for the first time is Nick Dobson. He's a principal consultant with City Limited, whose experience spans from the largest multinational to working with individual C-suite sponsors. Nick specialises in helping organisations figure out just how to determine their optimum portfolio of projects. So welcome, Nick. Great to see you. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. A pleasure to be here. <clears throat> As you suggested, it's my first event and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how this flows um, and some interesting and challenging questions. Let's, let's hope we can help some of the audience. Perfect. OK, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, a, a bit of an expert now, actually, <laughs> a regular contributor to Level Up is Jeroen. Jeroen Gertsen uh, combines his experience of consulting on projects with coaching and training to deliver real world learning to his clients. Regular contributor, as I mentioned. Great to see you back. Thank you very much for joining today, Jeroen. Thanks as well, Nick. And portfolio management is uh, one of my favourite topics to make sure we're doing the right things so that the projects are running in the right way. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Holger Hoitz is Director of um, uh, Pendrag Consulting and has led large, complex, multi-million dollar programs around the world. Regularly published and uh, increasingly frequently quoted, I think, Holger, it's fair to say. Uh, he provides thought leadership for corporate portfolio management. Holger joins us uh, for the first time today as a panelist. So welcome, Holger. Uh, thank you, and, and thanks for the invite. Uh, looking forward to um, talking about portfolio management. I compare myself to a football uh, professional. Um, my passion is my job, so um, I'm happy to talk about the topic, and I'm looking forward to having fun here. Excellent. It's brilliant when we can combine those things. And I have to say, that is one of the golden threads that kind of joins everybody on today's panel together. The enthusiasm that we have for the subjects in which, you know, we're going to be talking through today. So two regular contributors uh, to complete our panel of guests are Raj Khanna, first of all. He's the director and lead trainer at Raj Khanna Associates. Um, they work with clients around the world across the kind of PPM space, if you like. And also, um, Raj has worked as a gateway reviewer for the UK Cabinet Office, part of UK government. Raj draws on his experience in project programme and portfolio management. So welcome again, Raj. Great to see you. Good morning, Nick. Good morning, everyone. And great to see a great panel here today. And I'm looking forward to uh, listening to, uh, to and answering some questions from our colleagues. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, Mark Rovers joins us um, uh, he is the president at Interprom, uh, and he spends his time helping organisations deliver outstanding transformation programmes, combining the disciplines of project and change management with also those in the IT sector as well. So welcome back, Mark. Great to see you again. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Welcome. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm looking forward to some uh, great questions, so please only gr ask great questions. Thank you. <laughs> It's very true, actually. And the whole show is driven by your questions. So uh, you can see a little QR code on the screen if you're watching on a, a computer. Point your phone at it and that will jump you straight into Slido or just visit slido.com, type in the event number, and then you can add your questions and also vote up the ones that are already in there. Now, if you feel that you could also answer some of the questions today, then just volunteer in the chat and one of our colleagues will be in touch with you to welcome you to a panel on a future show. We're just planning out now, actually, the events from January through to March of 2022. So a great opportunity to volunteer. Completing our lineup for today is Suchitra. She is our question master for the day, and she joins us from Bangalore in India. So Suchitra, welcome. Please, may we have our first question. Hello, everyone. We have a question from Ron and Sari in the UK. Some of our business managers are resistant to deprioritizing their pet projects. 
even when they're not demonstrating any value to the business. Is there a good way to help with this? Raj, go ahead. Uh, it, it is challenging because everybody, once they have established, they want to be doing something, want to continue. We've been working with some colleagues in the police where we've created a prioritization matrix. And an analyst has done a fantastic work. And each change initiative is scored against certain criteria. For example, the urgency for change, the improvements, the complexity the cost, et cetera. And having, as we'll discuss this morning, a concept of a portfolio office, each change initiative is scored against those priority matrix. So even though an idea comes from the chief constable, it may only score 4040 as opposed to somebody else's idea 250. And that makes it quite neutral in assessing which projects are carried on. So that would be helpful to create an independent matrix to assess audio change initiatives. Okay, thank you very much, Raj. And uh, Nick, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think I'd like to sort of re-emphasize Raj's perspective in that it's really about depersonalizing the, the project. And pet projects are obviously invested for a variety of largely political and personal reasons. And if you can make them uh, or depersonalize them, by focusing on a, a level scoring system, as Raj suggests, or, or simply insisting on a cogent business case, then you can get a much more re reflected and considered view in the portfolio. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. Uh, Mark, how do you go about this? Uh, to build a bit, a little bit on that, what Nick just said, um, I'm going off of a recommendation given by the um, Business Relations Management Institute, where it says, before we get into these uh, projects, any of these ideas, suggestions, uh, projects, uh, for that matter, should have a value plan in which you clearly state what the value is that comes from an idea or a project. And that value plan carries through the whole life cycle. In other words, you know what generates the most value is something that should surface and should get the priority it deserves. What a great idea, thank you. And uh, Holger? Yeah, probably building on anything that has been said so far, uh, one of the great things we did on one of my programs was asking the business owners of the benefits to sign up to the benefits during the business case and not only afterwards uh, having them in charge for the delivery. Uh, that put a completely different spin on it. Um, otherwise, business cases get written and forgotten about, uh, not in this instance. And the, the di dynamics in the organization change completely. It's a, it's a really good point, isn't it, about you know, how do you actually keep that continuity of thought right from the very beginning all of the way through. And then you kind of ask people in the hard light of tennis, like, oh, did we really say that? Did we really <laughs> we need to commit to that as well? Oh, really? You know, <laughs> so good point. And um, I think, you know, it's quite interesting this, isn't it? Because I think we all invest. It doesn't matter how senior you are in an organization. Everybody invests to a certain extent, you know, in a project. If there's no passion and commitment there, then it's unlikely to get through even the earliest of stages of the business case review and, you know, all of that kind of thing. So it's a great question and an excellent way to kind of start off this whole session which I think prioritization is going to come back time and time again as a bit of a theme. Let's move on, Sachita. We'll take the next question, please. I can see questions are beginning to stack up. Question from Malcolm Sanders. Why does the difference between program portfolio and corporate portfolios matter? Surely they are both collections of projects and so have the same concerns. Okay, Nick, go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, it really is an interesting question because in a lot of organizations, you, you tend to see people using titles to describe roles rather than really looking at the management challenge we face. And I think that's the fundamental difference between these different entities. So if, if we say that a program is essentially about achieving a strategic goal, the portfolio of projects that sits beneath that is quite discreet. And the management concerns are about how you balance that portfolio in terms of achieving benefits realization as opposed to structuring the future of the business enabling type projects. Whereas if you're looking at a corporate portfolio, you're essentially worrying about 
how you manage constraints at a meta level across the organization, which are clearly quite different um, management challenges to face. And that's why the distinction is important. It's that they're all the same in that they're collections of projects or work packages or whatever else, but it's the complexity drivers and the, 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 the rationale that has demanded the initiative that means they require different styles of management. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeroen and then Raj. Yeah, it's uh, indeed uh, what you say uh, also about, uh, well, the names that you give it in a certain domain. You can't think that everything is in one big portfolio. If you look at the business, um, you have uh, basically, well, you have your cash cows and you want to maintain them. You have your rising stars, but hey, you may want to invest in, in those things. But uh, you have to make uh, also a decision on uh, what am I going to do in that domain? What am I going to do in that other domain? You can't put it all together. Uh, but you have also to uh, make a selection on, well, piece of the pie approach where you say, I give this amount of money to that domain because that's so important for our business. You look at it holistically. And you can just give it different names. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Raj and then Holger. I think the concept really of a corporate portfolio for me, uh, Malcolm, is it's all the programs and all the projects that are in an organization. And if you have a mature and well-resourced portfolio at corporate level, you can also include all the uh, business as usual changes that are going on. So collectively, we have the capacity to learn across the entire portfolio, not just the projects. And that's why I believe the word co corporate portfolio would be a better word at corporate level as opposed to individual programs and projects. Okay, thank you very much. And Holger? Yeah, I'm echoing that. And quite similar for me, it's down in the definition. Uh, what is a program portfolio and what is a corporate portfolio? Uh, typically, as Raj just said, um, program portfolio, I would assume business as usual is excluded, whereas corporate portfolios um, will contain business as usual activities. Um, also, program portfolios will be aligned to the outcomes at, and the value achieved while delivering those, where corporate portfolio is probably more modeled on the organizational structure. Okay. All right. So um, my takeaways from that really are to, you know, make sure that we're using the right nomenclature and make sure the whole organization understands what those things actually are. Um, that would help aid certainly with the communication and the clarity and so on. So thank you very much indeed, panel. Some great answers and a brilliant question. Um, Suchitra, let's move on. Take the next question, please. Question from a live viewer, Paco. I'm a certified project manager and would like to improve my change management skills. Please help me with how to do the course. What are the benefits of the APMG change management course? Okay, thank you very much, Paco. Um, Raj, do you want to start us off on this one? Yes, thank you, Nick. I think the difference really, and you picked that up um, as your question, the concept of project management, the way I describe it, is to put the dish on the table. So you get some food and you prepare it and it's ready to eat. That's really, if you were to purely look at the concepts of project management. Whereas the APMG change management, I believe today is the missing link. And more and more people, we need to be doing that. Because that talks about how to get individuals to eat the food. So in other words, in organizations, these fantastic systems that we've delivered, how do we get people to use it? And so change management syllabus covers the psychology of organizational and human side of change. And that, to me, is absolutely essential in, in the world that we are today. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Nick? Yeah, I, I think I'd echo the sentiment and go, go a step further in terms of a lot of people see project management, as, as Raj says, about delivering the plate to the table. You, you've delivered the products, the food is there. Why aren't the audience there for eating it? And whilst a lot of people would separate change management from project management, 
they are they're integrated skill sets and the trick is to engage the users in such a way during the project that there's no doubt they will tuck into the meal that's left behind and and agile as a product development methodology is really good at including the user in the journey of developing the product so there's a much greater chance of uh, change enablement happening so the focus of change management skills and improving your change management skills is really about how you can integrate the user into the journey of accepting the products Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. And I would say that the you know, particular benefit of the APMG change management qualification is really about understanding the toolkit that you're going to be using as a change manager, because the ambiance to use the restaurant analogy that you need um, for fast food is perhaps a little different from that, that you're looking to create for fine dining. And uh, the course itself will allow you to be able to identify, you know, if your change is uh, transactional, transformational, and what kind of tools and techniques you really want to be able to have you know, in your armory to be able to take a professional approach for preparing the organization or the solution that you're developing as part of the project. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, panel. Let's move on to the next question, please. Another question from Nishab, who's watching live. I am three plus years experience working professional. How, I, how can I improve my management skills? Please suggest. Okay, so this is a much broader kind of question around um, management of, uh, of people. I'm going to pick management of people and then I'm going to come to you, Nick, Nick next. So I would say the thing to work on is listening. <laughs> I kind of say that from from the heart, okay? I often, I don't listen well enough, uh, Michelle. So I, I would say start listening more and um, thinking about what you're going to do. Uh, Nick and then you, Yeah, I, I, I jumped in to answer this question because I've got a lot of empathy with, with the question. Um, but it's a piece of string question. I mean, management as a discipline covers so many sub-disciplines that it's hard to give you specific point advice. And it's very much about understanding your, your own um, strengths and weaknesses. <clears throat> but even looking at the most fundamental sort of literature on the subject of management, um, you don't go very far before you discover there are a number of key skills, planning, organising, staffing, directing and controlling are typically selected. And if you use that sort of organiser and self-analyse where your strengths and weaknesses lie, you should see a fairly clear route emerging quite quickly as to where you should focus effort in your own development to improve your management capacity. I wish I could wave a wand and say, well, it's this thing. But in truth, it's it's going to be a blend of different skills. And it's about your own um, three uh, own analysis of your position. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. A great start. Uh, Jeroen and then Holger. Yeah, and that's um, it's what uh, both of you have been saying, but that's also APMG where you have the AQRO model where you learn to understand who you are, uh, learn to understand how other people are and how they should uh, uh, well um, engage with each other. And indeed, for good engagement, listen first, seek first to understand, and only then you can be understood. Yeah. Great mantra. Thank you very much indeed, Holger. Yeah, it reminds me of a training course I once designed called Planning and Organizing for people who were not really project managers yet and had uh, some involvement with project managers. And one of the key outcomes was to focus on yourself first and realizing how much planning and organizing we all do in our daily life uh, you know who hasn't been married and planned for a wedding and then you figure out actually that's the one event that never gets rescheduled it, some items might get deprioritized but it will always happen on the day and you figure out about yourself how you organize and plan um, events or your own life and learn from that and take it into your professional life. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Raj, and then Mark. I would also recommend you have a look at two things. Um, one is Praxis Framework, uh, again, an APMG qualification, only because Praxis, apart from simply covering program and project management like other methods, also covers 
a very key concept of interpersonal skills. And that will be a good starting point and gives you competencies about, of course, listing is there, but engagement about leadership, about uh, stakeholder engagement, influencing. So there's that bit in there. And within that praxis, there is something called team praxis, which is about the characteristics of other people. So at times, you cannot, you know, it's not about you changing yourself. Sorry, you cannot change somebody else, but it's about you changing yourself to make sure you provide the right information how somebody else does. So have a look at those two as well, and that'll, that'll be quite uh, helpful for you. Excellent, thank you. And final thoughts on this one, Mart? Building on the answers given, um, uh, one thing that came to mind was em emotional e uh, emotional. Uh, IQ. I mean, that's something to uh, focus on. There's some, uh, some nice books written about that. And uh, our thought was also building on the previous answers was uh, be a relationship manager. Um, another product uh, that the APMG suite provides is uh, business relationship management uh, professional, for example, a training course uh, that also focuses on uh, management skills, for example. Brilliant. Okay, so quite a list to go at uh, in your reading over Christmas and into New Year to bake into those New Year's resolutions. Excellent. Thank you, panel. Let's move on to Chitra and we'll take the next question. Another question that's just come in from Daniel Hinsley. What would be your view on a new program management office? In your experience, what are the core foundational tenets which prop up the PMO and allow it to begin seeing efficiencies of practice? It was one of the saving saving groups, I think, of my early consulting career was that the PMO generally held everything together. An absolutely brilliant team. Raj, um, let's start off with you, please. I think, uh, Daniel, one of the first things I suggest you look at is this terminology when people talk about a PMO. What does the P in the PMO actually stand for? Is it project? Is it program? Is it portfolio? And I know somebody said, base it on the purpose of that department. To set up a program management office, that means it's specifically tied to a, a program, in my opinion. And hence the word that was mentioned this morning is that portfolio, it is all the programs, all the projects, and any business as usual activities that are in the organization. So I know we'll be talking about that later with Nick, about what are the functions of a portfolio management office. So Daniel will uh, answer, aim to answer your question later on in more detail, if that's okay with you. Thank you, Nick. Okay, thanks, thanks very much indeed. Um, Holger? Yeah, um, as we have here, program management office, um, I would have seen that falling in three parts. First, <clears throat> the strategic direction where you're aiming to be as a program and derive that um, down for your program management office. How are you best to support that? The second layer is the services. Which are the services you are going to provide either to the leadership or to the project managers or the teams you have within your remit? And the, the third component to that is what are the competencies and skill sets you have within your PMO to to provide those services. So looking at those three aspects and making sure you adequately play in all three of those. Okay, thank you, Nick. And then finally, Jeroen. Yeah, Daniel, I mean, this is a really interesting question um, and, and I absolutely mirror what both Holger and Raj have said in terms of clarity about what sort of office this is. But one of the aspects that is often overlooked by corporations is that the majority of PMOs are established by senior management because they wish to retain control over the resources and the workload. Um, but another rationale for structuring a PMO is to improve practice and, and give better guidance and assurance of a portfolio, program, project, whichever. 
And so your question about achieving efficiencies of practice is which sorts of efficiencies do we wish to achieve? Do we want to ramp up the delivery capability and reliability of the portfolio, in which case your, your PMO would need to be more of a guidance style PMO? Or do you wish to just secure management information to control resources, in which case you've got more of a control sort of a PMO? Now, this difference between control and guidance PMOs is quite important because it determines the sort of resource that you have to deploy and as Holger says, if you're going to cover all bases adequately, the amount of resource you're going to deploy into the PMO. So it's worth being clear from the outset with the senior stakeholders, what sort of efficiencies, what sort of outcomes you're looking for from the PMO. Great advice. Thank you very much. Final thoughts on this one, Jeroen? Yeah, what I'm uh, looking for uh, from the PMOs, whether it is on the project program or portfolio level, that uh, doesn't matter. They will always be able to support. But the most important thing is that they are also independent from the initiative, which means that they will give the beautiful transparency uh, on how it is happening and seeing whether it runs right enough. The biggest value is transparency that they will provide. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So, Suchita, let's take one more question and then we'll go into the focus topic. Question from Jeremy in Perth, Australia. How can we improve collaboration between project managers and project teams? Is there a preferred framework? Okay, panel. So, how would you go about doing that, uh, Jeroen? Yeah, preferred framework for that is agile project management because that will uh, learn also how the project manager will be more facilitating the teams than dominating, dominantly, um, yeah, steering the teams. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Nick. I think the real clue to, to getting collaboration and cooperation between the project teams and project managers at the tactical level is using an appropriate product development approach, whether it whether it be agile or waterfall. But but the real core to getting cohesive behavior is understanding and sharing goals and objectives. If if you have clarity of purpose and direction, there's yeah. seldom significant problems between getting co collaboration between the management and, and um, executive delivery layer. Okay, two, two really great answers to that. Um, so thank you very much and a brilliant question. So let's change gear a little bit now. I'm going to invite Raj to join me for our focus topic interview. Um, if you're watching and you're getting value from this, then just subscribe. You know, it's easy to do. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to the APMG International channel there. And um, if you're watching on LinkedIn, then you can follow us or indeed you can just subscribe to the show itself and we'll send you a little reminder every week of what's coming up next. Now, Raj, we often talk about a trio of leading practice for project management, program management, and the management of portfolios. And practitioners kind of vary, really, in their views about how much is common between these different disciplines and how much is genuinely unique, with some citing perhaps that there's more in common than is truly different and distinct. So if we may, please, can you help us out? Let's start off with a straightforward question, which is explaining what do we really mean by portfolio management in this context? <clears throat> Excellent question, Nick. And it's one of the panel have also shared our view. So it's a collective view. The fact that the term portfolio is co collective and ideally at organization level that contains all the change initiatives that are currently running in the organization. So somewhere central, we should keep a record of any programs, the projects within them, any independent projects, and any other businesses change initiatives that are currently running. So that really is our definition of, as I said, ours, it was the panel said as well, about a definition of a portfolio. Yeah, yeah thank you very much indeed. And do you, do you feel that, you know, portfolio, you know, managing portfolios is the ultimate destination for every project manager. Is it something that we should all aspire to become, or is it, or is it just one of the specialisms that you know we could end up becoming in our professional career? It's quite an interesting question because somebody asked me about twenty years ago, and um, or she introduced herself and she said, "Rod, I'm a project support, and when I grow up, I want to be a project manager." And I said, "Why?" Because you know, 
behind every successful project manager is an excellent project support. It's what your desirability is. Similar here, somebody sitting as a project manager will be, as, as just asked the question, working collectively with teams, trying to support and develop teams and deliver a product. So the first thing, of course, the answer is, do you have the capacity, sorry, do you have the capability? And of course, do you have the competency to, to work at portfolio level because you're working at strategic level and you're trying to coordinate a lot of work without actually managing the day to day. So some people, individuals may not prefer that. They actually want to be out and about talking to people. So for me, it's about what you prefer. And if you want to be working at strategic level and coordinating larger groups, then go down to the portfolio route. But if not, be a good project manager because managing, I know I was talking to somebody yesterday, she's managing Commonwealth 2022 at Birmingham. She's the project manager for it. And that's what she wants to do. So it's about your desirability. And, but of course, uh, if you can get the capacity, because they are linked in a lot of way, how you manage those, if you can get the competency capability, you're there. If you then have the desirability, then please apply, but not necessarily. Yeah, I, th I, th I think you're 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 spot on there. A lot of folks get the you know professional buzz out of that direct correlation between the activities that they do and the results that they can see. And there's something very immediate and intimate about working on a discrete deliverable, a discrete um, uh, piece of work, you know, within an engagement within a project. And the the further that you move away from that, in some ways. You know, you lose that direct connectivity. You're sort of—it's almost fly fly by wire, if you like. There's there's something yeah. else between you and and the deliverable. Um, yeah. So I think you're right. Follow your passion, and you know, if you're a yeah. hands-on kind of person that really, really gets yeah. the buzz from that, then you know, um, consider yeah. just becoming better at, at what you're doing. So, um, absolutely, uh, Raj. What 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 would you say would be you know, the, ultimately the value to an organization. So whether they're commercial or whether they're government, whether they're in health care services or whether they're in, you know, building infrastructure and so on, what value could an organization derive from deploying and using portfolio management as distinct from the other things that we've spoken about today? For me, it's absolutely essential that organizations have an equivalent, whatever they choose to call it, a corporate portfolio management office. Because we are spending trillions of dollars, euros, pounds, Amani reals in investing in, in our organization. <clears throat> and it, it's, if I go back to the health service was analyzed by an organization where I used to work called the Commission for Health Improvement in the UK, which has now become the Care Quality Commission. And there were some scoring mechanisms. And there was a score of two, which said, you are excellent in one area, but you do not have the capacity to learn from that area and improve the others. And so instead of getting a three or a four, you got a two. And that's the same concept in here. If you don't have a central portfolio management office, we don't have the capacity to learn from good things and then share them with things that are not working well. So that is one of the major advantages. And also, as the panel have mentioned today, I've made it a few, a few words myself, and I use that in a, in a blog that I wrote about four years ago, is first about creating a corporate methodology. People have talked about different frameworks. There isn't a right framework. There isn't a wrong framework, but there has to be a corporate framework that at least internally we use the same language. Whether you're in India, whether you're in Australia, whether you're in the UK, we must use a common terminology. So that's what a corporate portfolio management office will do, is to develop a corporate framework. Of course, it acts as in a supporting role, which Nick mentioned earlier to support the other programs and projects, and of course, the organization, the leadership team. And this is the bit I was saying about having a program office. You have a portfolio office, which will always, always be independent of the initiatives that are running. 
and therefore they'll be able to provide an assurance function. And the final point, again, working very closely with the police who are being externally assessed, I said regularly, all your programs and projects that are at least high risk must have an internal gateway review, which is done by your portfolio management office. So it provides a, all the things that Nick mentioned, and it's about providing support, it's providing guidance, but most crucially providing assurance that we are running. And that will hopefully answer the first question that was raised that says, when individual program managers, or sorry, change manage, uh, business, uh, I think you talked about the word, yeah, I think business managers are so pet projects, but actually that will take away that petness away because we have an independent appraisal. And if an initiative is no longer aligned to the corporate direction, the strategic priorities, or it's not going to add value, then it must be stopped. And it takes away that okay. personalization away completely. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed, Raj. Uh, excellent. Really enjoyed that. Um, a lot clearer now, uh, I think, uh, <laughs> around the topic. So let's go back to our panel, um, if we may, and uh, we're going to change gears a little bit. We now have questions which are more focused on portfolio management. So if you're watching online, you can swap over in Slido to the focus topic room. And uh, of course, you know, uh, let's start off with our first question, please, Sachitra. Question is from Stephen Jenner. I'd be keen to hear the panel's experience, insights, and advice on identifying and managing constrained resources, those that limit portfolio delivery, and specifically, has anyone any experience of applying critical chain theory at the portfolio level? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, so, Jeroen, let's jump in with you first, and then Nick. Yes. Um... The practical experience, well, you have in your uh, portfolio people with uh, multiple skills, which you can be very flexible on uh, rearranging in other positions, but uh, the critical resources, my practice is that they are mostly as well the business IT architects, uh, which help you manage all the dependencies that you have with all the initiatives in your portfolio. And the best way to go with the critical chain that you have is see where you have those critical dependencies, try to organize them within the program or even within the project, that there is a very close collaboration between all the people that have those dependencies with clear management on top of it. Thank you very much indeed. Interesting. And Nick? Yes, yeah, so interesting that the, the question gravitates towards the critical chain because I can't profess to personal direct experience of critical chain theory application in portfolio, other than that at the heart of critical chain clearly sits the concept of the golden resource. That is the the, the limiting resource for any organization, be it an individual or a physical resource. And and the underpinning theory that Goldratt had developed for that was don't don't try and keep chasing the golden resource maximize its use, optimize the use of the golden resource, and you'll get a, an overall improvement across the portfolio. So we have done a fair amount of work with significant clients in identification of the golden resource and optimization of those. And that really does pay dividends. Um, so Excellent. whether you try and make a broader application of critical chain um, remains to be seen. But the central to the critical chain is that golden resource and optimizing them does produce results. We've seen it again and again. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. And Holger, in your experience? Um, I think I give the consulting answer. It depends on your view. Um, I've been assured that um, if you are C-level executive, um, you don't have constraints in resources. Um, it's just a function of money and you get externals in um, to provide those services for you. Um, I'm, don't necessarily agree with that point of view, but it's one viewpoint we should at least consider. In terms of critical chain, um, my clients, um, as I have experienced it over the last 10, 15 years, most of them struggle with the concept of uh, resource management, or shall we call it now capacity management. Um, and for me, it's down to the failure of most organizations of planning. 
fundamentally uh, understanding what's actually required as a minimum product for planning uh, to have availability of the critical information uh, and understanding where the shortcomings are and, and where the dependencies are lying within your organization and then zooming in on resource management. So there's a whole precursor to the whole topic, uh, which typically gets forgotten. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Some interesting insights there and great question. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen, for uh, your contribution um, to today's event. Suchitra, let's move on. The next question is from our panelist, Nick Dobson. What should the top three considerations for a portfolio manager be in constituting the portfolio? Okay, Jeroen, start us off and then Holger. Okay, on top of the list, uh, definitely the value. And value is not just money. That's why you need to do multi-criteria analysis. And for that, you definitely need the good stakeholders identified that they can bring their what's in it for me to make the right uh, uh, decisions on the value. And the third uh, topic is the, definitely the capability that uh, you need to have to realize and also the capability to have the change implemented so the organization should also be capable to change. That will give you the best decision on what you can do. Should. Thank you very much. It's all about capability, Holger. Uh, first topic for me is strategic alignment. Making sure that any of your initiatives you're looking at is aligned to one and only one strategic objective, not multiple. Um, I had an organization where 92% of all items in their wish list were aligned to regulatory compliance. So making sure that anybody else in other portfolio agreements would uh, actually agree to theirs. Um, the second one is understanding um, the ranking criteria. Uh, between the different sub-portfolios you have to create in order to understand what's there. And then understanding really how you can possibly hide those criteria and the values attached to it when you do um, ultimately the leveling up and ranking of the initiatives. Hey, thank you very much indeed. Mart? Mine is maybe a little bit more daring. Um, especially with the strategic alignment that was just talked about. Um, answering the question, you know, what is it that we want to be good at compared to what do we need to be good at? That's maybe proof, proof of thought uh, for uh, any uh, portfolio manager who wants to align strategically. Hopefully the folks that do the strategy already have answered that question for you, often they did. It's a, it's a really good point, actually. What are we actually aligning to? And do we really, we, does everybody actually really understand what the strategy is? Great, great point. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Raj, and then I'm going to come back to Nick for his thoughts on, on, on how the panel answered the question or chose to answer the question this time. For me, whatever consideration we make in setting up a portfolio management function and office, it is for me an organizational memory. It is the information hub. Mm -hmm. It is similar to having a human resources department, a procurement department. Unfortunately, project program management do not have the same, um, for me, respect in an organization. And I've seen a number of public sector organizations in the UK, as soon as they had any cutbacks, the first thing they got rid of was the portfolio management office because they saw that quickly as, a, uh, as, as a, some sort of administrative function. And as soon as they did that, they wiped out the organizational memory. A number of them are going back to do it again. So just give that a respect. I believe it's got an important function, just like human resources, just like procurement, just like legal, and it should be there forever. Thank you, Nick. Okay, thank you very much. Nick, how, how, how did we do? Well, <laughs> it's, what a question to ask, Nick. Um, it was really heartening, actually, that it, what I heard was a fairly unanimous view that the first and foremost consideration is the, the strategic value or the value position that we're looking for. And, and in my mind, that is the lead component of the business case. What is the benefit of the initiative that we're sponsoring? So uh, there's a high degree of unanimity that first consideration should be 
really around the business case and predominantly its value position, which, you know, I, I would be surprised if the panel had come up with anything else. And then the second consideration I heard bubbling out was the um, respect for your resources and, and notwithstanding Holger's point that, that resource limitations are funny beasts because you can notionally buy a resource, but, but Holger did say that smilingly because often you can't buy the resource at short notice or in any meaningful way. So understanding where your limitations are, whether they're physical resource, machinery, plant uh, facilities, or whether they're human resource, but understanding those and their limitations on the portfolio has got to be an important consideration. So if I'm looking for my top three considerations, I've, I've got the top two from the panel that I'd have expected. That is what's the value, what, what's the business case supporting the initiative, what are the resources that will constrain its delivery. Really interested in Raj's response because this idea of the portfolio management office, the corporate portfolio management office acting as, as the corporate memory is a really interesting insight that could bear a lot more examination. I, mean, I kind of expected people to say dependencies and sequencing would be the third priority, but I think we ought to pay a lot more attention to what Raj is saying in terms of how do we actually learn the lessons and and ensure that the corporation stays true to its direction? If if we throw away our corporate memory, that's going to get lost. So, cracking answer there for me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, panel. Great question. Great answers. Um, so, Chitra, let's move on. Another live question from Stephen Jenner: If the corporate portfolio includes all projects and programs. How do we manage it in large, complex organizations with hundreds, if not thousands, of projects and programs? This can be one of those challenges, can't it, panel, of where the organization itself has yeah. scaled and grown and you know, had acquired new business units and new operations and new capabilities over time. But how on earth do you get that? you know, sensible joined up view across such a diverse portfolio? Uh, Jeroen, go ahead. Yeah, I already mentioned the piece of the pie approach. Uh, you would need to find the right sub portfolios where, uh, of course, uh, the key operation things that you want to, well, maintain your cash cow, uh, but uh, your strategic ones, but uh, maybe in your legal uh, domain. So organize it in uh, the well fitting sub portfolios. And of course, uh, do that with the focus on the dependencies that you bring the dependent things in the same sub-portfolio. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Raj. And then Nick? One of the key concepts we talk about within the Praxis framework is this delineation between a program and a project. Actually, there shouldn't be one. It's basically based on the scope. The larger the scope, the more you manage it as a program. The smaller the scope, you manage it as a project. And everything else fundamentally remains the same. And to me, this is exactly the same concept in here. Now, I talk about when you talk about large, complex organizations, well, look at some of the teaching hospitals in across the world. They themselves are very large. Some of them may be international branches everywhere else. If you create sub portfolios, instead of managing in a single one, what you tend to find is those individual units then start to create their own language. And, and therefore, for me, it's quite dangerous is allowing individuals to do that. And if you do have the resources, if you're telling me to manage hundreds and thousands and thousands of projects and programs, well, for me, come back to the question, you must resource the portfolio management office effectively. And if you do that, then I do believe a single one would work and you don't have to create multiple ones. Thank you very much. Uh, Holger? I'll probably start with um, a term from the Agile community. What's the minimum viable product here? Um, if you have a large, complex organization and you have that many projects and programs, do you really need to manage actively, from a corporate perspective, your projects? You should focus on the programs. <coughs> and limit your interaction with the programs to what you actually really require. And we, we talked about that. So Nick's summary um, was perfect on that. What, are, what is required in order to align 
the programs to our strategy, what are the critical um, dependencies and shortcomings we have from a resourcing perspective, and then consistently checking in on uh, the programs, whether they're still on track to deliver the value they promised to deliver. Projects, hey, thank you very they're not appearing on, on my radar even. Right, yeah. thank you very much indeed. And uh, Nick, finally on this. Yeah, I'm going to end up echoing Holger and Raj's perspective, but perhaps from a slightly different angle, which is every organisation, whether it recognises it or not, and whether it dignifies it with a portfolio management office, is running a corporate portfolio. It's just a de facto situation. So given that they're running those corporate portfolios, it's actually the job of the governance structure and the organisational structure to allocate resources. Essentially, we've got an, an amount of money to invest in change initiatives, and the allocation of that is what determines the shape of the portfolio. And, and so, uh, as Holger points out, it, it's not that the top level has got to micromanage thousands of different sub-projects. Well, that's what the governance structure is essentially devised to do. Um, and if the portfolio office is giving advice <laughs> on governance structures and the way in which resources get allocated, that's probably value adding. But there's no need to assume that the corporate portfolio manager is, is going to be cited of every single uh, product being generated at the project level. As Holger's uh, already intimated, that's, that's simply beneath them, um, and rightly so. But you have got to have faith in the governance structure and that it is aligning appropriately with the strategy and the value, as Raj suggested. So um, I think the answer is there in the round from, from all the panellists. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. One thought that I had on this was um, there's been some uh, interesting discussion recently on the increasing use of uh, data, big data in project and programme management, perhaps portfolio management as well. So that might be a topic that we might like to explore a little bit further, you know, maybe next year <laughs> when we're looking at yes. you know, how do we actually tap into data lakes and start to make, you know, more informed decisions. Because the, the challenge sometimes with governance structures is trying to balance the uh, effectiveness with pace of decision making and get that absolutely right. So very good. Look, we've got and it's a really interesting discussion today. Thank you very much indeed. I think we've got time, Suchita, for one last question. Um, so let's go ahead and take that next. Question from Rajneesh in India. What is the relationship between projects, programs and portfolios? Holger? Yeah, I think if we look at um, most of the frameworks we have out there, they build on each other. So you have projects, then a layer on top of that uh, as a program, and then possibly another layer on top being portfolio management. Uh, that's due to the history. Uh, I believe that um, portfolio management is an independent management discipline where program and project management are concerned with the delivery. So they draw from each other, i.e. projects and programs are reliant on portfolio management in order to do the right programs and projects in the first place. Uh, while at portfolio management, obviously, as we discussed, you need to understand what you have already as constraints. And one of the constraints typically is what you have already committed, whatever level of commitment you have it at, or programs and projects that are in flight. Uh, before you can admit another item uh, through the gates and get it into delivery. So, uh, yeah, two different disciplines, uh, very closely correlated to each other and not like Thank an onion built on top of each other. <laughs> okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Nick and then Raj. Right. Thank you very much. I mean, again, Raj almost answered this question from a different angle in the previous response, which is, do you want to differentiate projects from programs or are they on a continuum? And, and in essence, yes, they are on a continuum and portfolios are part of the same thing. These are all related to change management and, and the management of temporary constructs within an organization to deliver change. And to that extent, they're all the same. So the differentiation really emanates from what is the management challenge that you're trying to face? And it essentially hinges on complexity. And as you move up the, the curve of complexity from simple to complex, uh, you see that you require larger entities with more complex management structures addressing different management challenges. And that's the real key 
to, to the relationship between them. They are all part of the same family. They're all trying to achieve constructive change for the organization, but they are all different management responses to the challenges that you face at increasing levels of complexity. So the relationship is all around complexity and getting a good handle on that and the appropriate management response to it. Is this about managing corporate resource or is this about aligning stakeholders with a strategic direction or is it about getting agreement over what product addresses a particular problem um, are all at the initiative level. So it's, it's about management response to complexity from my perspective. Thank you very much. Raj, do you have anything to add? Just very quickly as an example, because, you know, Holger and Nick have answered the question extremely well. You just think about it, build, uh, renovating a house is, I would say, is a project. And renovating a whole street, I would manage it as a program. So just looking at examples, I hope, will help you understand the concept about what is what. Is the, what, is what. And it's about the layer of governance. That's the only thing for me that is different. If it's a program, you have a program board with lots of project boards. If it's a project, you just have a project board, but everything else, benefits, risk, stakeholders, is exactly the same. And for me, and again, Agile has been mentioned several times this morning, is about getting away from this, the old way of thinking that says project management is purely about focusing on the delivery. It's about making sure that whatever we deliver is being used. And if you follow the principles of Agile, you will see you deliver, you use, you deliver, you use. And as you use them, you're delivering your benefits. Okay, thank you very much indeed, yeah. panel. Great job. Um, everybody, I'd like to particularly thank our producers today, the audience who have been submitting some amazing questions. Uh, for us to get our heads around. So thank you very much, everybody who's been joining us online today and doing that. Um, so now I'd just like to invite each of you for your closing remarks on on today's session. Um, Raj, if you can take us our first, please, and then we'll go to Nick. Thank you all very much for all your input. And I've learned a lot, and especially from Holger, I take my point today, the, the example of a wedding. The wedding date doesn't change. And I think it's a great example. You think about prioritization and, and everything else will fit. And if you think you can change your wedding day by a week, then do your change initiatives the same way. If not, then that date is fixed and is sacrosanct. So thank you, Holger, for introducing a bit of um, you know, concepts of, of home life into this. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Raj. Uh, Nick and then Mart. Thank you again. I echo the sentiments. Thank you very much for having us on the panel and, and thank you for some cracking questions and, and food for thought. I mean, my, my big takeaway from this, well, they're all big takeaways. I think the motif for this ought to be focusing on the benefits, the value that we're trying to drive from the change. We'll start to scope the level of complexity that you're facing and we'll give you a good clue as to sort of management challenges and therefore the sort of management entity you'll want to bring into play. And if you're working at the corporate port level, that's going to mean a portfolio of works. Be very clear in, in how you manage it, but keep that eye on the value. I think I've just stolen your own thunder, but bad luck your own. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you it's always hard coming last actually on this on, on this particular <laughs> section uh mart and then holger be kind be kind <laughs> thank you nick um well nick out of nick took my point away from uh, the value so uh, i had to come up with another one quickly and i'm thinking how many organizations still out there um maybe they all have projects but do they have actually programs and do they even have actually portfolios uh, that those are sometimes uh, non-existing entities and organizations. So uh, if there's one takeaway from this, uh, I hope that uh, if you don't have them, I mean, uh, like program portfolios, I think we've heard enough today from the great questions and the brilliant answers as in, hey, there's a need for this. Um, we all should have it. Most definitely. Thank you very much, Holger. And then Jeroen. Yeah. Um... So thanks for the questions and all the responses. Um, what I take away from today, um, it's probably three things. One, um, despite having a level of panelists and experts, we don't have a common definition of portfolio management. At least I didn't agree with the one provided, uh, which is just an indication of the maturity of the discipline of portfolio management. Um, 
The second one was with regards to uh, the constraints we, we discussed and the different views on, on that. And the third one for me, um, I was surprised that we didn't talk more about uh, the con continuous uh, conversation about uh, agile and waterfall and so forth and how that interacts with each other. But that's probably, Nick, uh, a topic for a further panel uh, in the future to, to have that debate. Sure, and um, look forward to that. Um, so thank you very much indeed, Olga. Uh, you're in. Yeah, and uh, thanks uh, to all the panelists and also all the participants um, to uh, work on run, improve, change holistically your business so that you get a rich business. And for that, of course, the portfolio will help you make the right decisions um, aligned with the value strategy that you have. And I agree with you, Nick, that should be based on a vision. And your vision will probably be very much influenced by the enterprise big data analysis that you are doing, because that will show you better where you are standing, where you can go to. It was a great Thank session. Thank you very much Thanks indeed, um, Jeroen. It, it really, really was. I absolutely echo that. Um, Sachitra, uh, quality of questions today was fabulous, engagement was fabulous as well, and some very talented panelists. Fabulous show, sure, Nick, I must say. And we have so many questions that we definitely have to revisit this topic again in the future. So thank you to everyone. Okay, very good. Well, on that note, um, I'm sure that you've been inspired by our panel today. And if you're getting value from our content, please do leave a comment below and help spread the word by liking and sharing this video. We'll timestamp it so that you can share it on your social media and jump straight into the question that was put and the answers that were given. Coming up later on today at 1 p.m. GMT, we'll be exploring the world of cyber resilience and in particular data protection and data privacy. How do we keep our customer data secure and reflect the growing demands for increased control on that personally identifiable information or PII as the shorthand dictates it's known? Next Monday on the 20th, both episodes round off our year with general Q&A all on different careers, qualifications and how importantly could you plan to turn next year's new, new year resolutions into a definitive plan and some action. So subscribe to the show. We'll send you a personal summary of what's coming up and how you can join us here on the panel and level up your career with APMG. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next time.